In this lesson, we're going to look at the Yalta Conference, which took place in the Soviet Union in February of 1945. You'll probably recognise these gentlemen again. You've got Churchill of Great Britain on the left, Roosevelt of the United States in the middle, and Stalin of the Soviet Union on the right. So, a little bit about the Yalta meeting. It, it was in February of 1945, as we said, within the Soviet Union. Uh, Germany was not yet defeated, although it was near to defeat, uh, and Stalin wanted to remain within the Soviet Union, so the other two leaders had to come to him. There was something, it was described by Roosevelt as a family atmosphere. Roosevelt was very keen on maintaining friendly relationships, especially with the Soviet Union, but under the surface there were, however, serious disagreements, especially over the future of Poland. One of the agreements was that, the, was that the Soviet Union would actually take some land from Poland. It would, in fact, take the land it gained from Poland largely from the Nazi Soviet Pact. But in return, Poland would take some land from Germany, even more, in fact, than it gained after the Treaty of Versailles. Churchill was somewhat worried about this. One of the things he said was, I do not want to stuff the Polish goose until she dies of German indigestion. You know, in other words, like, putting so much of Germany into Poland, it, it's, it's, Poland's not going to be able to absorb that much of, of Germany in terms of the ethnic groups and, and, and the land and so on. But the big question was, who should govern Poland? Okay, if you remember, there were two groups, the London Poles, uh, who were basically anti-communist and anti-Stalin, and the Lublin Poles, set up in 1944, who were essentially a puppet government of Stalin and the Soviet Union. Stalin did, however, agree on elections. This seemed to be a huge breakthrough. Stalin agreed to elections. He didn't, by the way, these are not the words of Stalin. This, this is just me paraphrasing. So, Stalin, OK, the Lublin government can expand to include some London Poles. Essentially, as the Soviets, as the, sorry, as the Nazis retreated, the Lublin government had become the de facto the government of Poland. But Stalin agreed, yep, we can have some London Poles. They, they can be added to the Lublin government. And he also said there can be free elections as soon as possible. Um, Churchill was somewhat suspicious and, and wondered how soon these free elections would take place. And Stalin assured them that they were within a month. So this seemed to be a really good breakthrough. Stalin basically agreed on free elections. So let's look at some of the aspects of the Alta Agreement. And you should make a note of these. Some of them have highlighted as being very important because they really contribute later to the Cold War. But you should make a note of all of them. So first of all, liberated countries uh, would gain emergency governments of all significant anti-Nazi groups. So for example in Poland that would have to include definitely the London Poles. Remember they were responsible for helping to organise the Warsaw Uprising against uh, the, the forces of Nazi Germany. So any emergency government of anti-Nazi groups would have to include the London Poles, for example, in Poland and other groups, communist and non-communist in other areas, liberated from Nazi control by the Red Army. Uh, I've highlighted this one. Uh, we've already really talked about it. Free elections as soon as possible throughout all countries uh, recently liberated from Nazi control. You can see in the map here, uh, in the Alta Agreement, so part of East Poland went to Russia. That's the grey area of the map here with Vilnius. If you remember, that was actually invaded by Poland uh, right back um, in 1920. Uh, Brest-Litovsk, if you remember there was a treaty there at the, with the Germans, essentially forced on the Soviets at the towards the end of World War I. Except, sorry, I digress. Anyway, so the grey part went to the Soviet Union. That's basically the bit that they managed to get in the Nazi-Soviet pact with Hitler. Very, very similar. So Poland lost a lot of land in the east, but it did gain these pink areas from Germany. You can see, actually, there's the old Polish corridor. Well, Poland not only gets the Polish corridor and Danzig, which now becomes Gdansk, but it gets a, a large portion of East Germany as well. Other factors in the Alta Agreement that are very important. 
The Lublin government, as we already said, should include some London Poles. Stalin did agree to that. He said, yep, the London Poles can form part of the new Polish government. Prisoners of war from Soviet territory that were in the area of the Western powers should be sent to the USSR. Some um, citizens uh, in the new areas controlled by the Red Army had actually joined the German army to fight against the Soviet Union. And many of those, when they were sent back to the Soviet Union, they were sent to Gulag's concentration camps, and many of them were also executed. Very important, very, very significant this. Germany was divided into four zones. So have a look at the map here. The yellow area here was going to be part of the Soviet Union, or controlled by the Soviet Union for now. This was supposed to be temporary. It's divided into four zones. On a, on a temporary basis, it was assumed. You can see the green area here was going to be controlled by Britain. Uh, the purple area here was going to be controlled by the United States. And the French get this orange section over here. So four zones, French, British, American and Soviet. Berlin, you can see, which is something that's going to come up later. Berlin, the capital or the old capital of Germany, was deep in the heart of the Soviet zone. Lastly, the USSR agreed to help fight the war against Japan in reward for some territory in East Asia. They did quite well out of this, actually, because Japan was defeated really before Soviet forces were committed at all. There were some problems at Yalta, and these were they. There was an extremely different idea of what democracy was. According to the Western democracies, the United States, Britain, France, and so on, a democracy, many parties would be allowed to compete, and there would be free speech. People would be allowed to say their opinions and criticise the other parties. This was very different from Stalin's idea of communism, where essentially you'd be able to vote for communist candidates approved by Stalin. So there were really false expectations in the United States and the West. They thought essentially behind the Red Army, there'd be like Western style democracies, Western style governments would be set up. There's no way that Stalin would allow this in his sphere of influence. He wanted to maintain friendly countries that would be quite firmly under the control of the Soviet Union. And that couldn't happen if they were Western style democracies. So problems, free speech, of course. And this is really critical, this point here. You should make a note of this and highlight it. There couldn't be a compromise. It simply was not possible. If Stalin was going to have a sphere of influence, a zone of influence, with countries friendly to the Soviet Union, well, either they would be democratic and they would choose their own way, which very likely would not be friendly to the Soviet Union, or they would be friendly to the USSR. The only way these countries are going to be friendly to the USSR if free speech is clamped down on and there's a lack of democracy. Because if they have democracy, they're very likely to move away from the USSR. A leading point here. Leading Poles were anti-Soviet. Remember what had happened to Poland, the, the Nazi Soviet pact. The Soviet Union had agreed to divide the Soviet Union in two. The Katyn massacre of Polish officers in the Soviet controlled zone. Many reasons for leading Poles, not all of them, there were some pro-communists, but many were highly anti-Soviet and most of the significant ones were anti-Soviet, anti-Soviet Union. Well if free speech was going to be allowed there's no way there's going to be a friendly Poland to the Soviet Union so Stalin had to destroy free speech to make a friendly Poland. Well let's see at what actually happened. So. In theory, these free elections have been agreed. In theory, the London Poles are going to join the Lublin Poles. But what actually happened? Well, Molotov. Remember, Molotov is the Soviet foreign minister. He'd signed the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact with Nazi Germany back in 1939. Molotov basically refused to let the London Poles take a real part in Polish government. They were essentially blocked. They didn't have any significant power in the new government. And not only that, on March the 16th, non-Soviet leaders, that is non-communist leaders, were invited to Warsaw for 
talks, except they were arrested and never seen again, almost certainly executed within Moscow. And he, this, this, this statement here from Ambassador Harriman, the United States Ambassador, we began to realise that Stalin's language was somewhat different from ours. OK, so I hope you've made a note of the main agreements at Yalta and some of the problems and how it worked out in practice. Good luck with the quiz.